First and first, how are you? <laughs> and just back from after completing eight eight dates of our UK tour, so I only got back yesterday. So I'm, and this is my relaxing day. <laughs> <laughs> Do you enjoy being on the on the road still? Uh, yeah, it's it's of course it, it's a. Uh, you know, when it works, it, it's, uh, it's fantastic. And of course, the great thing about live stuff is that, that you get to meet the people who like you, you know, and they'll tell you what they think of you, good or bad. <laughs> because uh, am I right in saying, and uh, maybe this is wrong, but when you were younger, you weren't the most natural performer. You kind of had to get used to the idea of yourself being kind of the singer and the person in front. I think, well, I think the difference between me and a lot of people is the fact that you, you, a lot of artists would tell you that they started in the clubs, they were working with mm -hmm. bands, started it very little, you know, it's an, like an apprenticeship, earning, performing yes. before nobody, and then gradually building up and then finding success and it all goes great. With me, I, did, I didn't come up that way. I came up by just playing the piano and starting to write songs. And I didn't do a concert until two years into my success, mm -hmm. which is very unusual. After Nothing Rhyme took off in 1970, you would expect me to be touring. So, so my whole background growing up musically was, was just at home, writing songs, sitting at the piano. That was my background. So when I started to perform, I had no real idea. I was, I was very amateurish about how to go about it. I didn't look after my voice too well because I, I wasn't that experienced. So, so gradually, I've learned over the years what to do and how to look after my voice and how to perform. And I, I enjoy it very much now. In the beginning then, what was your ambition so to say what, what was the thing that compelled you to write your first songs and to kind of pursue that avenue of creative uh, expression just to be a success just to be a, I, I wasn't thinking globally I never envisaged being success in America or Japan or those kind of places I saw my success entirely in the, in the country I was living in I was living in, 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 in England and so therefore I was very happy to be a success in England but there I was flying over to Holland and to Germany and to France back and forth within a couple of days, which was great because it meant that I could, I wasn't away too long and I could get back to the work that I enjoyed doing the most, which of course was, was uh, spending the day uh, writing songs. When did this habit, and I don't know if we, we should call it a habit, but wh when did it start that right of writing songs? And, and kind of, I suppose I, I heard some interview where you said you, you spend about nine hours a day writing. I don't know if you still do, but uh, that diligently honing your craft, when did that start? Well, the, the honing of my craft came much later, but, but okay. uh, in the beginning, in the beginning, I just started to write songs. I think the catalyst for, for me and for many young people, 1962, when the Beatles arrived, mm. they were very different to anybody else before them. In England, we had Cliff Richard and the Shadows, and they were the big successes. But you never thought, you never identified with them in the sense that you could be like them. When the Beatles turned up, they were 19, 20 years of age. They had Beatle haircuts. They had, they had a color. They had a unique look. And they wrote great songs. And so you felt, well, if they could do it, because they didn't need a degree to write them, they couldn't read music, they just wrote out of a love of music. So because we had that in our brain, we thought, well, if they could do it, it's possibly that we could do it. So my huge big influence to begin writing songs were the Beatles and Bob Dylan. And so those were the major influences in the garden shed trying to write songs. So that would have been, I would have been 16 years old, I guess. Right. Uh, time. When did you write the first song that you that you were proud of, or did that come immediately? No, well, I, I wouldn't say immediately, but, but the first song I was proud of, which I'm still waiting to record, I keep <laughs> trying to do it, is a song called Ready Miss Steady. It's just, okay. it's just a great little song. So, you know, that, that that's, but I, I haven't yet got around to recording it, but uh, it's on the agenda. I've performed it live a few times. Because it's a cute little song. You I mean you're ready, Miss Steady? She travels through the cities on the seats on her own, just looking for a fellow who can sit on a throne to make a fool and marry lights whenever she can. Is all this girl that walks them can understand? She's ready, Miss Steady, and everyone knows she's ready, Miss Steady. Who really goes for her man? I mean, that's that's 15, 16 year old kid. So, I think. Well, but that's that's excellent, and especially I think you can hear of where you where you 
wanted to go with with songwriting and and, and kind of that those those ideas so so when the success did hit and, and you mentioned it and, and especially international as well did it come as a surprise did it come as a surprise to you when you wrote for instance uh, alone again did you know it was a great song or how does that work from your perspective well, I think it's not difficult for me. I don't think I was written in a writing session to, um, you know, the, the sitting in a room on my own. And uh, it was just one of the songs I was writing and I was happy with it. Um, you know, I didn't think it was any more special or worse than, than anything else I've done. And that's a good thing. That's a good policy to have, not to know. God forbid you should have to know every time you write something if it was going to be a success. I was very happy with the song. And the recording session that took place after that involved two songs. It involved Alone Again and Out of the Question. And on the session itself, everybody said that the next single at that time should be Out of the Question. They didn't really see Alone Again as being okay. commercial. And so, uh, you know, but at the end of the day, uh, my manager said, we'll stick with Alone Again. It may not be as commercial, but it's a better song. So, so as I say, I write songs. Success for me is always finishing what I think is a good song. The work mm -hmm. I put into it. You mentioned earlier, my nine to five. That's a Brill Building mentality. Brill Building, if you don't know, was in New York in the late 50s, where people like uh, Carol King, Neil Sedaka, Neil Diamond would go into a room at nine o'clock, owned by this publisher, clock in at, five, at nine, sit in a room with a piano, and then leave at five o'clock for five days a week. So I, I have that mentality because I think it's good discipline. So I can sit for five days trying to come up with melodies. And if I don't come up with anything after a few days, it's never a waste of time because you're practicing. So that there's always a positive to it. But um, so that's, you know, that's pretty much how it goes about. Do, do you have specific times that you prefer to write or specific uh, moods or mindsets that you're in or can it be is, is it just every day is it is one of those things no, that no. you have to do no 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 it's when i'm need to when i'm needing to be uh, coming up with melodies the key to songwriting is it, i have this what's known as a uh, irvin berlin uh, approach in other words the hardest thing to come up with are good melodies mm. you, you know you can write lyrics you can be a good lyricist uh, throughout your life I think you're born with that ability but you develop the ability to write music through your love of music as I say we don't read music so it's the love of popular music that gets into you which out of that comes the potential new melodies so I'll sit there to come up with a good melody and come up with a good melody you can trunk it mm -hmm. you can put it to one side till you're ready to record and the great thing about good melodies is they survive any length of time but if you finish a lyric and you don't use it it can become dated so that's, that's the whole point. If I need to be coming up with a melody, then I'll go into the discipline. I'll go into the routine of, of, of writing. But other than that, like at the moment now, it's all about most of this year is about the new album. It's about promotion. It's about touring. It's arguable that by the middle of next year, I'll be thinking to myself, you know, I want to get back. So we're looking, we'd probably be looking at 2024 uh, for the future recordings. Well, if, if we jump to the, the new album Driven, then... Because I can imagine you've been making music for quite some time. That time, I, that space of time, I don't know how long that is, where, where you try to come up with melodies for new songs. Uh, having written already so many melodies, is, is that a tricky thing for you? Or do you have to kind of wade your way through old ideas? How, how do you kind of arrive at what would become the new songs? The same as I've always done. I'm very conscious of my contemporaries, the likes yeah. of Ray Davis, the likes of Paul Simon. I think I find it interesting that the, the lack of melody in their records now is, is mm. perhaps to do with age. It's arguable that, you know, you reach a point as a songwriter where you've written words on music, where you lose that kind of love of it. You kind of become interested in other things. As I say, I'll buy, I'll buy the new Paul Simon album and musically with the band he has, it'd be fantastic. And his lyrics will be as good as ever. But melody wise, it's, it's not. Melody wise, it's losing out. And I think that's a danger that I try really hard to avoid and I want to avoid. I don't want a situation where you might say it's a weak melody on that song, but it's a good lyric. I wouldn't be happy with that. So, so the key, as I've always said, is the melody. And I, I, I write the way I've always written. I just sit there, no analysis. There's no, it isn't rocket science. It's just the way I do it. There's no plan. It's just uh, sit there play i love the keyboard i'll search for chord variations which inspire me 
Yeah, and, and you know, it's a keyboard that hasn't changed in 300 years. <laughs> Does the quiet of Jersey help? Is, it, is that something that kind of uh, plays a role in it? The, the, the solitude, in a sense? Yeah, yeah, I need that. I mean, during the pandemic, through the two years of lockdown, uh, that suited me fine because that's what I do anyway when I had to go away mm. and write lyrics. I mean, the process for me is, is that once the melodies are there and I've trunked them, and then I meet the producer to make the next record, the lyrics aren't written. So he'll hear the melody with gibberish words. And then uh, he'll go away to prepare for recording in two months, three months. And then I'll spend the two months it takes. Lyric writing takes a long time, but, it's, but at the end of the day, it's very satisfying. Right. And this time around, it was... Um... No, I have to, uh, Andy Wright, who who uh, helped produce the album. So, so, what was that initial meeting with him then? When you said you have those kind of uh, sketches of songs or, or the, the bare bones of these songs, and and then you start talking with him about it, and how how did the songs kind of start to get fleshed out? Well, what, what the difference with Andy and Ethan? Ethan Johns did the last album. Ethan Johns is the son of Glyn Johns. And that's my most successful album in over, over 30 right. years. So the difference is that with Ethan, he only heard the melodies and gibberish words. With, with Andy, once I knew we were going to record, the pandemic hit us. Mm. And so therefore, I spent most of that time preparing the lyrics. So when, when Andy, when I sat down with Andy, I had the lyrics written. So that's the okay. difference. Uh, the lyrics were, and you know, he liked of the 14 or 15 I played him. He picked the 12 that he wanted to do or 13. And as I say, most of those lyrics were written because of the, the global situation that was affecting us all. Did that influence then the, the type of lyrics that you wrote? Or because I've, I've also read an interview where you said you, you don't necessarily have to uh, experience a specific thing to be able to write about it, that you, that you can, if, if you have the knowledge about certain concepts or whatever, you can write a perfectly well song about it. So, so what was this writing process for you like uh, in terms of the themes? Did, did the pandemic and the fact that, that life was different for a while, uh, did that affect at all the, the music? No. no, the solitude, no, no, because I'm locked away. I'm conscious of what's going on in the world. I'm conscious of the pandemic and the effect of COVID on everybody, mm -hmm. horror of it all. and, and uh, but for me, the subject matter is the same as always. I just get into a subject. I start either with a title maybe, or I start with a blank piece of paper. No idea what it's going to be about. And that's exciting. And after a couple of days of not finding any idea, suddenly you hit on it. And then you end up writing more verses than you actually need. And that's, that's just something in you. Uh, so it, it, it's, a, it's a marvelous, I mean, I, I love the art of, of songwriting because it's the key to everything I do. So there's no analysis in my mind of how I go about it. Okay. I think, I mean, what I was conscious of during the writing that I thought I could slip in was climate change because okay. whatever was going on with COVID, every other day you'd hear something to do with COVID, with, with climate change. So Take Love, uh, a song has a verse about uh, climate change and there's another song that mentions it. So I like to do those kind of things in a subtle way. Right. Uh, you know, to, to involve issues but not in a kind of very public way as, as you mentioned you you don't like to analyze it too much but did, i'm gonna try anyways uh, do, do you know where this love to to write songs comes from well what what that kind of spark is for you is, is it kind of the creating something out of nothing or what, what is it it's just a love of the i mean i'm it's the you know the inspiration to begin writing songs is what you hear on the radio. Sure. You know, it's the, that, that generates in you more than it does your friends. For some reason, it hits you. Something in you gets get taken in by that more than your friends who just like the records and stuff. Sure. Like that. So, but it's, it's I mean, I, I, I don't know. Uh, what's your question again? Let me, I digress. No, look, kind of where that passion comes from, but it's one of those things, I suppose. It's, it's very difficult to put into words. It's just there, right? Yeah, it's just there. I mean, it's always been there because it, nothing has changed. I've never been bored by sitting on a piano. I tried to learn guitar, but I'm left-handed and it didn't work out because the, the guitar teacher wouldn't teach me left-handed. <laughs> so I dropped the guitar, went on to drums and I played the drums on the piano. So it's, it's kind of cool. <laughs> I mean, it's everything put together. I mean, you, you've got people like McCartney who can play great acoustic guitar. 
he can play good piano, and he, apart from his bass, he's able to use those in his songwriting. With me, it's pretty much all the piano. I mean, I, I've used other keyboards, I have to say, to, for effects. But generally speaking, nine times out of 10, it will always be, be me with the piano. You know, in my mind's eye, I, I wish I had learned acoustic guitar because it might have given me something. But, but then I've learned to play the guitar on the piano. Mm. I do songs that, that, that strum. <laughs> I can do that. I can strum like a folk song. Well, I've written folk songs. So I can strum it uh, like, a, like a guitar. So I get away. <laughs> Has technology play, uh, changed your uh, playing style at all? No, it's affected. Um, it's made me buy all the, all the little digital devices mm. to, um, to record my demos and stuff, to record songs at home. But I, I hate them because okay. I, I, I need my glasses to read. So I'd be coming up with an idea and I'd, I'd have the digital little devices only about that size. Brilliant sound, brilliant sound. But every time I'd have to keep putting my glasses on to change. <laughs> my stick, I, I, I'm very happy with cassettes and the, the, the original 70s Ghetto Blasters, which have the inbuilt microphone. Mm. That's the key to the difference between Ghetto Blasters today. The Ghetto Blasters you get today don't have the inbuilt mics. So the inbuilt mics means that I can plonk it on the piano. And I put in the cassette and off I go. And if I stop it, I can rewind. I can see it without needing glasses. The sound, right. the sound isn't great. The sound on the digital devices is much better. But I don't care. If I write what is a good melody, it doesn't matter how, how rough it may sound. Sure. And now I mentioned uh, Andy Wright, who uh, has worked with Simply Red a lot. And now one of the per people you've worked with uh, on this album as well is uh, Mick Hucknall. <laughs> So what was it like getting the chess? And then I suppose with Katie Tunstall as, uh, as well, what was your approach to, to working with other people on this record? Well, we're in an era now where duets are quite the in thing. So there's a, there's a lot of that going on. So with we, we, we Take Love, we finished recording it and, and uh, Andy and I said, you know, this would be a good song for a duet. And then I mentioned that, that uh, Katie had done a song called Suddenly I See, which was a big hit for her sure. a few weeks back. So we felt it was a similar tempo. So we said, yeah, let's send it to her. So she lives in California, sent it to her. And she really liked it. And she recorded her vocal over there. We just said, do what you want on it. We didn't in, 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 instill in her what she needed to do. And, uh, uh, and that was it. We loved it. And then she came back to London. I haven't made a video in 30 years. So we did a video together. That was great fun. Had a good chat, good talk. She's a lovely person. Simple with Mick. It was a case of uh, with Andy because he produced Simply Red, and he said I knew Mick was a fan because I had I had I'd been to a concert where, where I met him in uh, backstage, so he he was up for it. He said to to Andy uh, if there's something there that Ray would like me to sing, so we sent him uh, uh, Love Actually. Uh, so we sent him that by must be by uh, yeah, we sent him Love Casualty and Bygones, uh, and we thought Love Casualty might be what he would go for. But he really liked Bygones, and um, he's done a really nice version, so it's, it's, it's nice. Do, when you write those things, uh, for instance, with uh, Bygones, could you hear the second person on it? No. Okay. No, no that, that just happens. I mean, I, I, uh, we do it live now, for example, uh, with my guitar player in concert, and... Uh, and it's just me. He's he's my guitar player is rocking it out, uh, guitar wise. But it's just me singing it. No, it's fine. It's nice to have people singing with you, but it's uh, you know it it works fine even without. The, the way you describe it and your approach to songwriting, and I've seen videos of you where you, where you show that you you try to keep up to date with uh, music coming out and and kind of listening to all kinds of uh, genres and. Everything is, is music music still a very much a big exploration for you where you kind of uh, sift through all uh, all kinds of music and kind of look for inspiration or do you kind of ha have you settled well settled is not the right word but have you found kind of a way that works for you? No, I, I, I'm searching all the time. I mean, you can't be a contemporary songwriter if you don't like what's going on. Hmm. I remember George Harrison famously quoted said he this was in his in the eighties. He was quoted as saying something to the effect that he couldn't, he didn't like anything he heard on the radio now. So you have to go back to a George Harrison of 16, 17. He would have loved everything he heard on the radio. That's the difference and stuff. So it's very important to like what's going on. 
I might buy a rap record by Jay-Z or somebody like that, but, but you know, melodically, I'm not going to get much from it, but production wise, mm. it'd be interesting. And I, you can use those ideas. You can incorporate them in, in working with producers on your own material. So there's always important. I mean, I, I, you know, I buy everything because it's important to like what's going on and to listen to what's going on and to get something out of it. It's uh, and it's not a pressure. It's not a job that, that, you know, you feel you have to do it. You do it because, that's what you enjoy doing. The excitement of sitting down in my music room with two massive speakers. I hate to listen to stuff on a computer. Okay. I'm computer illiterate. But I, so if my daughter says to me that there's a track here they want you to listen to, I'll say, put it on the CD and I'll take it up to my music room. I don't want to listen on a computer. So I love to sit in a room where there's a CD and, and uh, that's, that's always been a joy. There is an aspect of sharing it with an audience because you do share it. Uh, otherwise, you would keep it to yourself. So, so what is that interaction that like for you? We mentioned the playing live a little bit in the beginning. So, so what is that interaction of, of wanting to share what you've created? Yeah, I mean, I'm very confident. I mean, I, if I when I go on stage for two hours, I'm very confident, very, uh, very at home, very at ease, singing my own songs. Now, if I was to sing other people's songs, I'd be as nervous, I'd be frightened, I'd, be not like, I'd worry about what the audience would think. But what I know when I'm performing, they, they know my voice, they're hearing me sing well, it's my songs I'm playing, it, it's, it, 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 it's fine, it, it, uh, it works out really well. So I don't, have any, uh, I don't have any issues on that front. The songs are there, of course I want people to, to like them, there's no mm -hmm. question about that. And when a record is made, I want people to like the record. But I'm not, I mean, I, I've, you know, the album before the one with Ethan, Latin Allergy, I was really proud of that album. We recorded it in Spain and that wasn't a huge success. And you could argue the album before that wasn't a huge success. But for me, they were. Mm -hmm. I was working with different producers. I really enjoyed the product. But you're in a business where you have to fight your corner. You have to, and it, there's something good about, you know, moving forward into the next one. What's the next one going to be? You will have the songs. Who will be the producer, the musicians? Yeah, good. <laughs> is, is there one song from, uh, maybe you don't think about it in this, uh, this fashion, but is there one song that you've written throughout your career that you kind of uh, felt sad about that it didn't receive more attention? That, that, that you think, well, this is, this is a really good song and, and nobody's really getting it? No, I'm, I mean, I've had issues. I wrote a song after 9-11. Uh, I wrote a song called All They Wanted to Say, uh, and which over the years I've had lots of reaction from America. And when we were in, in New York recently for the concert, for the concert we did there, I performed it, and it, almost, it was almost emotional. It, it deals with an aspect of 9-11 that really wasn't dealt with at the time. Most of the, the furor, the, 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 the writing on the 9-11 attack was the planes hitting the buildings. Right. But I picked up on an aspect where people were leaving messages to their loved ones, knowing that they weren't going to survive. And just to say, I love you. And that the importance of that phrase in, uh, for those people and for the people who would get the message. So that, so that what the song was about. So I'm really proud of that song. It was written, it's about America. It's not, it didn't happen in Europe. And we performed it a few times here. So yeah, it was never a hit. Uh, it was, it was. I don't think it was played that much. But I'm really proud of it. There's another yeah, song. Yeah. There's another song I wrote called "It's Easy to See When You're Blind." I'm really proud of that song. So yeah, the Peggy Lee song. I can't, yeah, can't think straight. It was a joy to do. So yeah, I have many songs. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. But Final really question. <laughs> Sorry. Final question then. Uh, when did you arrive at the title "Driven"? Because that's what I am. I think you'll probably guess that from talking to you. <laughs> there you go. That's pretty much sums it. The title was going to be, um, it was going to be um, Moderation in Excess. Mm. So, but, but we figured that uh, people liked something more simple. So I said, well, I'm driven. This, it's very much in me to do it. I mean, I'm 75 years of age. You know, I should maybe be retired and become a gardener or something. <laughs> well, I was going to ask, so do you see yourself doing this kind of the, the, till you drop? This, this is kind of what you do? No, I don't think of it in that way. I just think of it as being, the, I mean, the moment is where we're at and I'm really enjoying it. I'm really happy with the work, the musicians I work with. Because I, I didn't tell you that, you know, when I work with Ethan Johns, I let him choose the musicians. Mm. I don't want to, I, I have, I know good musicians. I work with good musicians, but I don't push my people onto the producer. 
with, with Andy. I let Andy pick the musicians. And here's how it works. Every time for, for, with the Latin musicians in Spain, with, that, with Ian, uh, with, with um, uh, Ethan and with Andy, I turn up, we turn up the studio on the Monday, the studio's booked for five days. I meet the musicians for the first time. They haven't heard anything. They stand around the piano. I play the first song, maybe twice. They go back to their chairs and we rehearse it a few times. Light goes on, we take it. Mm. We do a few more takes, we go on to the next song. Okay. That's, and it's really, really fun. Uh, it's a real joy. So if that continues, um, why not? May I thank you uh, immensely for taking the time to talk with me?